Good morning to you all. I'm very grateful that you are able to join us this day in worship and listen to God's word. Before the message, let us seek the Lord and pray along with me. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful for keeping all of us safe and healthy. And the news of this vaccination for the protection of our health over COVID-19 is now available to most of us and looking forward to more normal days to each, see each other in persons, in fellowship, or in worship services together. Thank you for your precious word. As in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says that for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the divisions of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of our heart. May you soften our hearts this morning to listen to your word and to equip and to edify us. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, we're glad that uh, you can join us this morning in worship and studying of God's word. We're continuing our study on the book of Romans. And today we'll be looking at Romans chapter 6 and in the last half of the chapter of verses 14 to 23. Yeah. But before we look in 14 to 23 of verses chapter 6, I'd like to reflect briefly on the first part of chapter 6 uh, as we look into the exposition of God's word. Romans chapter 6 verse 1 to 7 has been uh, taught to us two weeks ago. The topic is that we're to walk in newness of life. We're to walk in newness of life. I do want to share some slides and you can so, so that you can also follow on, in the, especially in the scripture verses. Chapter 6, verse 3 and 4, it says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glory of the Father, we too may walk in newness of life. Then in chapter 6, verse 1 to 7, it talks about baptism, the symbolic of baptism. As you become a Christian, you're baptized into Christ. You walk into the water, you, it's symbolic of your dying to Christ, buried in Christ, and risen with Christ. That Christ is raised from the dead by the glory of God, that we as Christians, we may walk in newness of life. And um, now in the Verses 8 to 13, we have, uh, let me continue on the slides here. Chapter 8, chapter 6, and then verse 8 to 13, verses 9 to 11 and 13. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion or, or ruler over him. Verse 10 of Romans 6, for the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he, gave, he lives, he lives to God. So you as Christians must consider or reckon yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not present your members to sin as instrument for unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instrument for righteousness. You know, this is what it means in, in, in Romans chapter 6, verse verses 8 to, to 13, is that we need to know that Christ uh, was being raised and he no longer will die again, but he's alive. We just celebrate uh, Easter, his celebration, resurrection, and that we need to know that Christ is alive. We serve a living God. And then we also need to consider or reckon uh, our status is that we're dead to sin, but alive to God. And then, therefore, we, we need to present ourselves daily uh, to God that who has brought from death to life our members to God as instrument of righteousness, as instrument of righteousness. So here, I'd like to mention a little bit about sin, about sin because the Bible talks about sin and grace and God and love in Christ. And the book of Romans actually uh, talk a lot, about, a lot about sin and the sin nature and so forth. Yeah. And we know, you know, that uh, there are three things I want to quickly mention about sin here in, the, in, in Romans. Uh, sin 
is an offense, number one sin is an offense and the disease described in chapter 1 to 5 of Romans. Sin is a trespass, it's an offense and a disease. You know, like somebody getting a disease, yeah. And we know that, you know, chapter 5 talks about Adam's, because of Adam's one sin, it was passed on to all human mankind, right? And also because of one man's uh, redemption on the cross, Jesus Christ. Uh, the first Adam sin, the second Adam brought back and bring forth life uh, in him and were being renewed. Yeah? But sin, number one, is an offense and a disease described in chapter 1 to 5 of Romans. In chapter 6, Sin is described as a master or ruling power. Sin is described as a master or ruling power here in chapter 6. And, uh, and, then, and then secondly, sin is not destroyed in the believer. Sin is not completely destroyed in our life as a Christian. It is still active and can still injure us. See, the born-again Christian is to fight against the drives and the pull of sin. And we know that. In reality, we're still living in a sin-cursed world, and sin is still uh, not totally destroyed here on this earth. It's with us, and we're born with a sinful nature. Thirdly, okay, sin, okay, secondly, sin is not destroying the believer. Thirdly, the body, our physical body, is not the source of sin. Even though we're infected with sin, we have the sinful nature, but the body itself is not the source of sin, the sinful nature from Adam that comes to us is, uh, is, is that sin within us, inside us. It's a disease, and um, the disease of sin. So the man's experience proves that the body is the instrument of, however, the, from our experiences, the body is the instrument of sin. Our physical body is the organ which sin uses to manifest and satisfy itself. Our physical body is the organ which sin uses to manifest and satisfy itself. The body, our body is under the inf heavy influence and severe uh, power of sin and corruption. So much so that this, the sensual appetites of the body tend to enslave our, our soul and lead the man or the human being to sin, even against our very best judgment sometimes. See, therefore, that's why in chapter, Romans chapter 6, verse 12, it said, therefore, the believer is strongly exhorted to resist. I say, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies. Romans 6 verse 12. Let not, let not sin reign in your mortal body. Remember that. Yeah. And then verse 13 said, present or you yourself to God. You yourself to God, those uh, who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instrument of right, as instrument of right for righteousness. So Romans chapter 6, verses uh, 8 to 13, it talks about where to reckon ourselves dead to sin alive to God. So this is partly a, a, a direction and emphasis for us to, to, to know our status and to move forward against the overcome sin. Now, today's passage is from Romans chapter 6, verse 14 to 23. And it takes an additional emphasis or gives us a, another direction on how we can overcome sin. We need to overcome sin. And God is giving us additional uh, instrument, additional equipment, emphasis, and direction on how to overcome sin. So looking at Romans chapter 6, verse 14 to 23, the Apostle Paul uh, said it is, it is actually by the power of God's grace and deciding whom you will serve. See, Apostle Paul takes the additional emphasis, the direction for us to overcome, overcome sin. And it is by the power of God's grace and deciding whom you will serve, whom you and me to serve. We are called to serve the, the right master. We're called to serve the right master. Romans chapter 6, verse 14, 23 talks about this. We're the call. We're called to serve the right master. And um, because we're living under, under the freedom of God's grace, well, we can all fully overcome sin. And interesting enough, Apostle Paul fully understand, you know, that the Roman Christians were struggling with sin, law, and under the freedom of grace. So Apostle Paul addressed it here in, in chapter 6, uh, verses 14 to 23, even like us as we struggle as well with sin. And in Romans chapter 6, there were two questions was asked. Two questions were asked in Romans chapter 6. Uh, one question is Romans chapter 6, verse 1. Second question is in Romans chapter 6, verse 15. Oh, let me 
open up the PowerPoint here. So two questions to begin with to ask, and we, I need to quickly just share with you. We are called to serve the right master. Romans chapter 1, chapter 6, verse 1 says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? The apostle Paul said, by no means may it never be. Here, chapter 5, because it talks about the abounding grace of God. Now, now in chapter 6, you know, uh, it's questionable, what shall we continue in our sin since we have grace? So should we sin so the grace may abound? By no means, no way. And then chapter 6, verse 15, what then? Are we to sin because we are not under the law, but under the grace, but under grace? By no means, Apostle Paul. So let me explain it and, and let me close the slides here and go on from here. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Apostle Paul said, no, by no means. See, the law came in to increase the trespass. The law came in to, to show us our sin and offenses. But where sin increased, grace abounded more. Very true. Yes, God does by his gracious abounding grace. God's abounding grace will always be for us and will forgive us. But because we are under his grace, we don't have to go that way of sin. Though we know that God's grace is there to cover us, to forgive us, we all know that, right? But we don't have to go that way of sin. We all know the scripture verse 1 John 1, 1.9. It says that uh, if we confess our sins, it's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. First John 1, if we confess, if we have sinned, we confess our sin. God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yes, but as Christians, we know that when we deliberately or intentionally walk in sin, okay, when a person deliberately and intentionally walk and commit in sin, walk in sin, continue in sin. We hurt ourselves. We feel the guilt. We're convict, convicted by God's word of our wrongdoing. And by his Holy Spirit, we, we, by his Holy Spirit, we, send the, we sense the emptiness, the lack of spiritual power from God when we sin. sin. So it's, like, it's just like somebody who injured himself. He, has to, he or she has to go to the hospital because you were injured by your own neglect or foolishness of decision. You ended up in, in the hospital for some treatments of injuries, which may take some days or weeks, and you're out of commission or to do any activity. So Apostle Paul said, by no means, no. We don't know who have to go in that way of sin because uh, it is through grace. God's grace covers us, but we don't have to. By no means, don't and don't go that way of sin. We don't have to because God's grace Say, don't go that way. God's grace is certainly forgiven, but we don't go that way. We don't have to. So the question, the second question in verse 15, what then? Are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? Here again, Apostle Paul with the affirmative say, by no means. Yes, we're not under law, but by no means we're under grace. We are not to continue in sin. Verse 14 says, the sin is no longer your master. For you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. Freedom of God's grace. In the context here, you know, for the Jews and the Roman Christians, the law refers here always, most of the time, to Mosaic law and the Old Testament law and the requirements of God's good works to achieve salvation. See, that's the belief of the Jews and Roman Christians in their growing up. Say, oh, we've got to keep the law. We've got, to, we got, to, we got to follow the requirement of good, good works to achieve salvation. But you and me know salvation is only by grace through faith in Christ, not by good works. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 89 talks about that. And we also know that Christ, Jesus Christ came. You know, he himself said, I came not to abolish the law. I came to fulfill the laws. And he summed up all the laws of the Old Testament and the Ten Commandments, everything else, to the great commandment, to a great commandment. Then in Matthew 22, it says that we are to love God with all our heart and our mind, and we are to love our neighbors and ourselves. That's the greatest commandment that we follow today, the law of Christ. 
to love God with all our heart and our mind, to love our neighbor as ourselves. So verse 15, the question then, are we to sin, are we to sin because we're not under law but under grace? By no means. It is not the requirement of the law of good works that we are saved, but it is by God's grace we are saved. So no, 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 do not continue in your sin. Because why? God has set us free to serve the right master, not the other master called sin. So in this passage, Romans chapter 6, verse 14 to 23, it's all about serving the right master. You have to decide to serve the right master. Apostle Paul here, verses 16 to 19, uses the illustration, for example, of a slave serving in bondage to sin. And he also gave his warning if you serve the wrong master, which is sin, which is sin. I'm going to share here and look into the scripture and we'll go into the exposition of the scripture and ex I'm explain to you. Yeah. Serving the right master. We are to serve the right master. Hey, verse 16, do you not know? Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, the word here, obedient slave, means the Greek word is doulos, a servant. You are slaves to the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, of obedience to God, which leads to righteousness. Basically saying that, don't you realize that if you become a slave of whatever you choose to obey, you become the slave to that sin, to that thing, which leads to death. And you, if you choose to obey God, then you lead to righteousness. Leads to righteousness. Verse 17 to 19, the Apostle Paul said, But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching, teaching to which you were committed. Here, Apostle Paul writing to Romans and also to us Christians, but give thanks to God. Yeah, you were once slaves of sin, enslaved by sin, but now you, you have become obedient because of God's Holy Spirit in you and been changed. You're dead to sin, alive to God. You obey the standard of teaching which you are being hearing right now and committed to. And which it in having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Become slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking here in human terms because we are natural limitation. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. What also Paul here is explaining here that here is that you know you are now free from slavery to sin. You have become slaves to righteousness. And verse 19 is I'm, I'm, I'm because of your of the weakness of human nature, you know, I'm speaking human terms. Apostle Paul actually say I'm using the illustration of slavery to help you understand this concept. And the same verse in verse 19, he gives a warning. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity, to lawlessness, you know, chaos. Lawlessness means chaos and disorder, lack of control, leading to more lawlessness and deeper into sin. When you were slave to sin, this is what happened. So you went into deeper, deeper into sin. But now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. That's the word sanctification, a good word. The word sanctification means to be set apart. You're being set apart. Yo, we as Christians, we are on the process of growth towards spiritual maturity that's always in process throughout our earthly journey. That's what it means. We're being sanctified. We're not perfect right now, but we are being sanctified by God's grace and His Holy Spirit power towards spiritual maturity that's always in process throughout our earthly journey on this earth. Hmm. So, so looking at, the, at these verses in, in, in uh, verses 16 and 19, we see the progression from a, from a captivity of bondage of sin, right? In verse 17 and, uh, or so, it said, when we were lost, yeah, we were all enslaved by sin. We had no choice but to sin, to follow sin. And there's a pull and drive of sin that we're tempted to. 
Our slavery grew worse and worse, even deeper there in verse 19. You know, there are people who are not Christian, they're enslaved by sin. They keep going deeper and deeper. They get more frustration and they are afraid of death. They have no way. They have no, no direction in life. That's what it said. But through Christ, and what's it in? Through Christ, we are free from slavery to sin. Now you're free through Christ on the cross, dying for us on the cross. Now we are free. And now, because we are free, I need to serve the right master. Christ and his enabling grace towards righteous living. I need to serve the right master. Jesus Christ and his enabling grace towards righteous living. So make sure you serve the right master, Christ and his enabling grace. Now, verses 20 or 23, the apostle Paul gave consequences of serving the wrong master's sin. He gives the consequences of serving the wrong master uh, called sin. Let's look at the scripture verses. Verses 6, chapter 6, verse 20. Sorry, verses 6 to 21. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Meaning that, you know, when you were slave to sin, yeah, you were free from any obligation to do what's right. Yeah, you were slaves. You, 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 you don't know how to do what's right. We were enslaved in your sin. Verse 21, but what fruit? When you were slave, what, what was the fruit and results you were getting at that time from the things you now know there was shame. When you were enslaved, you, you commit those sins and the things that does not glorify God. They hurt you. They hurt yourself. They hurt others. It was shameful. For the end of those things, the worst thing was, is death. The word death is separation from God. No communication with God. No life. In verse 22, but now you've been set free from sin. You're free from the from the power of sin, not from, not from the presence of sin, the presence of sin is still with us, but you're free from the power of sin, the enslavement, enslavement of sin, and become slaves of God. We as Christians, the fruit then, the results you get leads to sanctification. There's that word again, sanctification in the process of our journey of spiritual maturity. And in the end, one day eternal life with God. Okay, and then verse 24, the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in and through Christ Jesus, our Lord. If you serve and work for the master's sin, my friend, there's a consequence of the wages that you receive. It's only death. The word death stands for separation from God, from the living God. When somebody dies, there's separation. When you die in your sin, there's separation from the living God and separation from his enabling grace and power. And that's sad. That is sad. The wages of sin. So that's the warning. So brothers and sisters in Christ, as I close, you know, last year, 2020, with the COVID-19 pandemic, and with all the tensions on ethnic and racial disparity and on the black community, the black community, um, trying to maneuver the, the slides here. That's right. Juneteenth. Because of the tension on ethnic and racial disparity and on the black community, Juneteenth was brought to the surface or highlighted publicly. Many of us, including myself, even though I've heard it a bit briefly, it was like the first time I heard of it, or many of us first time hearing it, referring to June 19, 1865, which commemorates the end of slavery in the United States. Yeah. I, I remember June 19 because one of my one of our daughters was born on June 19, by, but June 10 wasn't in my mind. Yeah. Only was brought up kind of last year. So, so June 19, June 10 is the oldest national celebration known as Freedom Day or Emancipation Day here in the U.S. But right now, it's a, not a national holiday yet, only in, some, only in some states. Not yet even here in California. 
So June 19, 1865 marks the day that Union soldiers landed in Galveston, Texas. Okay. Uh, with the word, uh, Union soldiers landed in Galveston, Texas with the word that the Civil War has ended and the African slaves were free. The news did not reach the enslaved people in Texas until two and a half years after President Abraham Lincoln signed the Emanci Emancipation Pro Proclamation in January 1st, 1863, which frees all slaves in the Confederate States. For, two, for more than two and a half years, the enslaved African slaves in Texas did not know that they were free. So when they were told, and when they knew they were freed, many left their enslaving masters in, in, in good spirit and feelings of freedom. Wow, of course, most and almost all of them do not know or, or, or ways to live or enjoy their freedom because they have been enslaved for so many years there in their life. But they have to learn and to know and to recognize their freedom. Imagine the feelings of freedom. Imagine the feelings, feelings of freedom when you have been so enslaved for so many years and kept uh, in captivity. I am free. I'm free. I'm no longer a slave. They would shout. I'm no longer restricted like before. Now I can go to school. Now my kids can go to school to read and write. And I can, as an adult can do that to learn. I can go. I'm free to go anywhere. And I can own my own land and start my own business, businesses. That was the joy of freedom. They have a new master. They were enslaved, but now they have a new master called freedom. You see, brothers and sisters in Christ, as we study and examine the scripture here in Romans chapter 6, we were once slaves to sin. But after coming to know and true faith in Jesus Christ, we are set free. Free from the slavery to sin. Like the African slaves who were freed, they were no longer restricted. They never have to go back to their enslaving master. The old master of sin, just like we don't have to go back to the old master of sin. The old master of sin will always come calling. But you and I do not have to respond to the old master of sin. We're free to serve the right master, not the wrong master, which is sin. But the right master is Jesus Christ and his enabling grace. Boy, that's a joy and a beauty to know that I serve the right master and his enabling grace is upon me. So if you are born a Korean Christian and you are free from the slavery to sin, but consistently you do need to have examination of your own lifestyle. If you allow yourself to be still in the bondage of slavery to sin, and you know what sin is it if you are in slavery to particular sin. It is time to get out of the bondage and live free to serve the right master. Jesus Christ and his enabling grace. If you are born again Christian, but if you're not born again Christian, if you're not a born again Christian, it's hard for you to examine your lifestyle, but you can. You're enslaved and you need to come to be free. You don't want to be enslaved and restricted in the sin. You want to come out to know Jesus Christ, come to the cross, Jesus Christ, and receive him and let him be the right master of your life and enjoy his enabling grace. Let us close in prayer. God the Father, we thank you for your word. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 19, the scripture identified to us the works of the flesh and sin, which is sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, Fits of anger, rivalries, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things of this. And I warn you, and I warn you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. We thank you, Heavenly Father, where we can overcome sin when we serve, serve the right master. That is you, our Lord Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for the penalty of our sins.
and will make free from the slavery and bondage of sin. When the other master, when the other wrong master sin comes calling, help us to walk away from it and help us with the power of the Holy Spirit to follow and serve you, our master Jesus Christ, and under your enabling grace. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. God bless each one of us.